uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, for those of you that have just arrived, my name is Dawn Tomlinson and I'm a proud resident of Fort Langley. Uh, recently retired from the Langley School District and um, as I said earlier, I think I was asked to moderate this evening because uh, much of my career was as a principal at Langley Secondary and I think they figured if I could handle more than a thousand teenagers in assembly that I could handle this evening's forum. So the purpose of this evening is to hear from our candidates regarding issues that matter to our community to better inform ourselves when we vote in October. Uh, and this evening we are going to be hearing now from the mayor candidates. So I just, before we start that, um, I did have a question at the end of the trustee program, um, and I did want, and it was a very good question, it was something that I uh, hadn't thought about letting you know, but um, just so you know, for the school trustees, the township gets five seats. So what you saw here earlier, there were 10 candidates, five seats for from the township that um, are selected to be on uh, the school board and uh, two would be from the city. So uh, again, I'm going to begin this program by acknowledging that, uh, that we are honored to gather on the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Kwantlen First Nation who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. Thank you to the Fort Langley Community Association and its volunteers for organizing and hosting this important event in our community. We are a community association of volunteers who meet on every second Tuesday of the month here in the community hall. Uh, we've handed out uh, info brochures. They look like this. If you ha weren't able to pick one up, they're on the welcome table. Um, and uh, the next meeting is actually October 11th at 7.30 in person here or on Zoom. So please check that out. We are live streaming this event, so a big shout out to All in One Productions for making this happen. I'd also like to um, thank Wendell's for providing coffee for this evening. And finally, thank you to the candidates who have taken time to participate in this evening's program. Want to just remind people about decorum for this evening. We expect everyone this evening to behave in a respectful manner. Uh, we'd like you also to remind you to please turn off your cell phones or mute them. Uh, candidates are expected to speak in a courteous manner, are to avoid inflammatory statements and name calling, and are only permitted to speak when it's their turn. Candidates and audience members, Please refrain from making any sounds or gestures that may be considered distracting while others are speaking. Um, failure to behave appropriately will result in a warning from the principal. Uh, continued infractions will result in that person being asked to leave the meeting out of respect for those that are here this evening to learn about the candidates that could be serving our community. We have a tight time frame this evening um, with, with uh, our candidates and we want to also allow some time afterwards for you to have some one-on-one -on -one time to ask questions. So as such, we are asking you not to applaud or make comments. We're just asking for respectful decorum this evening. So we are going to begin the format this evening for the mayor candidates is they are going to have uh, two minutes to introduce themselves. Our timer is at the front. He will hold up the yellow card when there's 15 seconds remaining in your time. And then the red card will go up when your time is up and the mic will be turned off. When we get to the question period, the questions that we have collected uh, either online or in person as people were coming in, they will be drawn from uh, the box that we have here. Um, so uh, we haven't picked out which ones we're asking of different people. Um, and the candidates will have one minute to respond to the question. The question will be given to each candidate. Because there are only four, we will actually ask that question of each of the candidates. Uh, again, the yellow card will go up when you have 15 seconds remaining. The red card will go up when the mic is going to be turned off. And then finally, uh, they will, uh, the candidates will have an opportunity to do a one-minute close at the end if there are any comments that they would like to include that they haven't had an opportunity to do. So we're going to draw to see who goes first for their two-minute introduction. 
Michelle Sparrow will begin. And I'm just going to remind you that each time, if you could just remember to um, state your name, it's going to be a little easier with only four candidates. But just uh, so that we do that, and also to make sure that the mic is quite close so that everybody could hear. Aaron is your timekeeper, and he'll be ready to go as soon as you start. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. So my name is Michelle Sparrow, and I'm running for mayor of the Township of Langley. Uh, I was born and raised here. I feel really grateful to be raising my four daughters here as well. Uh, I attended Fort Langley Elementary and have come to this hall for many uh, events. It's got a lot of uh, happy memories for me. Uh, I am the government relations lead and conduct advisor for the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board. And I'm running here today because I don't see myself or my perspective represented in any one of my opponents. I don't see my desire for change from the status quo or my track record of standing for just that. This job, uh, this role, is very much based on relationships. And it's a need to have a skill in that to be able to build relationships, to be able to have an idea that you present to your colleagues, to be able to collaborate and bring them alongside of you, and to be able to move that idea forward and into policy. While a lack of that skill can be mitigated by choosing the people who sit next to you at the table, I believe that that takes away from the organic and best parts of our democracy. I hope that you will uh, learn a little bit more about me. My brochure is in the back, uh, and my website as well has my full platform, which I, I don't have time to share with you tonight, but I appreciate everyone for being here, uh, and I'm looking forward to this event. Thank you. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I, I know it takes a lot of effort to sometimes come to events like this and you're sitting on a plastic chair for sometimes a long period of time. So thank you for coming. My name is Blair Whitmarsh. I've been on council for eight years and I am running as an independent mayor uh, for this community because I believe that we should preserve the great community that we have. It's a great place to live, work and play, but we also need to move forward for the future. So while preserving great community, moving forward, those are the reasons that I'm running. I'm a, a grandfather of five, a father, a father of three, and my wife is also here with me tonight. And uh, we've lived in the Brookswood area for 21 years. I've been a professor for 26 of those of the years that I've been in uh, living in township of uh, in Langley, uh, a total time. And I've been really excited about the opportunity to serve this council for the last eight years. I'm running as an independent mayor because I think it's up to you as the voters to decide who is going to be on your council, but not only who's on your council, but who you can speak to and have influence with for the next four years. And so I believe in an independent council and an independent mayor. We have a very diverse community. Our community is represented by all sorts of different people. Just look around this room and you'll see the diversity in this room. And in order to be effective as a leader, you need to have a collaborative leader that can work well with all sorts of people, all kinds of ages, and all people in our community, letting every voice be heard. And I'm that kind of collaborative leader. I have a lot of experience in collaborative leadership, and now is the time to have a collaborative leader as mayor and also collaborative council members. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, really appreciate everybody here taking time out to, to come and meet us and hear us speak. My name is Eric Woodward, and uh, I'm running for mayor uh, with a great team with over 160 years of public service experience that that I think that we need on council to, to get things done. You know, uh, I think you do have a great choice in this election to elect an amazing team that has a clear plan for progress and a way to pay for it and do a significant catch up for our chronic infrastructure deficit in roads, parks and facilities and get a fair deal from development to build a livable community that we just haven't been getting in place for the last eight years. And for the last four on council, I've seen that it's very challenging to get big things done. And, and there's a lot of talk about collaboration and relationships, and I agree. And uh, I'm, I'm interested to learn that I get to pick who's on council. I think we will, of course, learn uh, uh, who's, who's elected, and we'll work with anybody to get things done. But the challenge is that we have a, a significant amount of things to get done. I grew up here in Langley, and uh, in Langley City, and went to LSS and graduated and been here most of my life. And so many, I've been in the technology industry for a number of years, and a lot of work here in Fort Langley, which I'm sure many of you know about. And on council, really wanting to see the township get better, 
and it's move away from a status quo that I don't believe is serving residents the way we could be. I imagine what Langley could be, the things that we could get done, from more rec facilities, finishing our roads, to more progress in Alder Grove, preserving our real areas, getting real progress for the fire service, real progress on affordable housing and homelessness. So many things we could be doing that we aren't getting done. And that's why I'm running with a transparent and open team that everybody can look at and decide if they want to give it a try versus, I think, secret slates that have been going on here for years. We're being very open and transparent of who we are, what we want to get done, and how we're going to do it. Thank you. Thank you, and my name is Rich Coleman. I'm running for mayor with the Elevate Langley team. Our, our brochures at the back with the points about our, our platform, and also you can go on our website and read it, and I can tell you that we have, I've, I've worked through this, and I'm pretty sure we can do it without raising taxes and get things done for this community. I have a long history of, in this community. Michelle and I met, moved here in 1984. We've been, made, we've been married 48 years. We raised our children here. We have seven grandchildren here close by, which is a real gift, I must admit. I have a real heart for this community, and I really wanted to come and try and give more back. When after I left public life on the provincial level, I felt that there was still more I wanted to give. When the opportunity came up to look at running for mayor, I thought, you know what? I just want to try and see if I can make things better and get things done, which I'd done in the past. My record would tell you that I could do that, whether it's a seismic upgrade at the the fine arts school in this community or all the, all the grants and stuff I got for the Farm Museum or whether it's the Langley Event Center. All of those things I have been able to do because I can work together with people and accomplish things. I have a great friends in the Kwantlen First Nations. They're very good friends of mine. The chief, uh, Marilyn Gabriel, actually reached out to me and asked for a lawn sign here when I decided to run for mayor because I have a long relationship working for them and in this community. And in this community, I have a long history. A history such that my wife, Michelle, who's here tonight, had her office in this building, building when she was a manager of the Chamber of Commerce in Fort Langley and ran the, the tourist information uh, community here. So we have a real connection in Langley. And I believe with a team of people working together with a vision like we have on our platform, we can deal with things like policing and fire, transportation, recreation, and things in a way that's practical and isn't hard on the, on the taxpayer of this community. And I think our plan is very strong for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to move on to the question and answer um, part of our program. So as I said before, the origin of the questions are we had um, put uh, it out on the Facebook to gather questions and then there were also questions that were gathered uh, this evening as people were coming in. So uh, I've just picked the first question out of the box and we are going to pick a name of the person who's going to begin. So that will be Blair Whitmarsh. I'm going to read the question out twice, uh, and then you can begin. You have one minute to respond to the question, and ag again, the yellow card will go up at the 45-second mark. So the question is, currently, Fort Langley and East Walnut Grove receives water from well number two, which is very corrosive to plumbing fixtures. Given that all taxpayers pay the same water rates, what do you propose, if anything, should be done? Should we all be on the Greater Vancouver Water District, 100%? I'm going to read it out one more time. Currently, Fort Langley and East Walnut Grove receives water from well number two, which is very corrosive to plumbing fixtures. Given that all taxpayers pay the same water rates, what do you propose, if anything, should be done? Should we be on GVWD 100%? So the, uh, the water situation in Fort Langley and East Walnut Grove is, uh, is concerning. Um, it, really, the, the, it's not an issue of, of safety or, or drinking water safety, but there has been an issue around corrosiveness corrosive to the system, piping, pipes and so on that connected to the water system and infrastructure. And so what's currently happening is that there is a uh, pH update, uh, upgrade uh, system that's being put in place will be done by the end of November. I think we should really do a good assessment to see how that works. I think that that's going to make a significant difference to the water in Fort Langley and East Walnut Grove. Um, there's a lot of evidence to show that it'll raise that pH level up to 8.3 to 8.5 in that range. And then once that is in place, I think we need to do then a, an analysis of it to see how it goes, monitor very carefully, 
And if, in fact, we need to move to GVRD, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but I'd rather take a graduated approach, which is less expensive and allows us to really look at what the system is going and what's actually happening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Is timing start? Or, okay, thank you. Yeah, I've been very clear on our position on this because it's been my position on council for the last two to three years to try to close well number two in Fort Langley. The amount of money and damage that it's been causing to the residents of Fort Langley and East Walnut Grove uh, the cost in the thousands of dollars for many, many residents, $100,000 for a, a condo building in Bedford Landing, and we're, I think, trifling over a very small amount of money when a lot of residents are really suffering financially, and this has been left to go on for years. And uh, trying to solve it, it can be solved in a day by just turning it off and switching to Metro Vancouver, which has more than enough capacity at the Jericho Reservoir. That should have been done two to three years ago. The well is also only 65 feet, very subject to contamination from the Fraser River. And I don't agree with spending uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money to upgrade it when we don't know if that's going to be a permanent long-term solution. Permanent long-term solution is to switch to the Coquitlam Reservoir that we're paying tens of millions of dollars contributing to. Thank you. So first of all, thanks to the people that called me and told me about this in a bit more detail. I did some research, and I know that the plant has actually, I went and checked that it's actually been tendered and it's been started for construction for the, for the treatment. I also found out that the, there's pH levels uh, certain times of the year high even within the metro water system coming directly from the, from, the, from the reservoirs, which can also be a challenge. So treatment has to be there for both whether the water is coming from well or blended. It has to be there so we can actually keep the pH levels in check. And, and I agree that and once you have that, then you, you can decide on the well side, but the bottom line is no matter where the water's coming, we should be checking for this pH level for the corrosiveness it's causing and the difficulties it's causing for residents here. And we need to find solutions for them, and that first thing is get it under control. Thank you very much. And thank you to the gentleman uh, in the corner who provided a, a really great informational uh, opportunity for, for residents who are here tonight. I hope everyone does go and check that out. It's a lot of hard work that they've put into it. Uh, and, and I agree uh, with, with Eric. I think we do need to be looking at closing that, that well. And I do think we need to be looking to tra transition to uh, Metro Vancouver Water. Uh, we are a growing community. And I think we have outgrown uh, the ability to just be relying on um, on that, and I think we need to look at transitioning to to Metro Vancouver. So I, I would be supportive of that. I think it's the right move for for our community and for those who are especially dealing with this uh, this issue. That's a long time coming. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are going to draw a name to start with the next question. Uh, Rich Coleman. The question is, and I'll read it out twice. What ideas do you bring to the table for preservation of green space and tree canopy? What ideas do you bring to the table for preservation of green space and tree canopy? Well, I think a lot of that work's been done with the tree canopy bylaw and some of the stuff that's already in place, and we have to make sure that it works for our residences. I believe that uh, a preservation of trees and smart development and smart green space development is important because it's not just about trails. Sometimes it's about a pace where calm and, and, and the birds and the bees and whatever it can be. I also think it's important to recognize that uh, as we go through the process for this, people need to have the input in the community and where they come from. Each area of this community is a bit different, geography and, and, and trees. I was very much involved in the preservation of the trees down in Glen Valley when that came to me and, and getting people to the table to try and work with the municipality, which was great that they all came together and saved that. I think we have an example of a community that can work together and do this. We just have to remember that we, we do it in conjunction with taking the advice that people that give us, and then when we work on the laws, it will work for all of us. Am I ready? You're ready? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So while I appreciate that we, we do have a new bylaw in place, I think it actually completely misses the mark in actually addressing protecting our tree canopy. Uh, I think we're looking at protecting uh, trees on people's property. Uh, you know, someone who wants to remove a tree that, that is not serving them anymore on their, on their residence is, is not protecting our tree canopy. We need to be looking at addressing the problem, which is protecting trees on developable land and forcing our uh, development 
to be done in a way that preserves as much trees as possible. And I think there are a lot of unique ways that if required, developers are able to incorporate uh, trees into their development and protect those stands that are important. And I think we need to be looking at doing more uh, and not just focused on our individual homeowner trees in their backyards. Thank you. In addition to the uh, tree protection bylaw, we actually have uh, just approved as a council a community forest management strategy. And in that strategy, it talks about increasing the tree canopy across the entire township, not just in lands that are already developed, not in any area, uh, and not just in lands that could be developed, but also in ALR land. It's a community management forest strategy that covers the entire township of Langley. And uh, in that, I think some of the plans in there talk about particularly having a very strong tree planting program. Um, I don't think we have a strong enough tree planting program, a tree replacement program when we do have to remove trees. I think we have to have a higher number of trees being planted. And then we have to be very strategic about the type of trees that we plant. And uh, being part of the, of the committee that looked at this, uh, this area, there was a lot of discussion around the type of trees and that we in the past have not always planted the best trees, those that give us the best canopy. So I think there's a number of things we can do with that that'll really help us develop that tree canopy as we go forward. Yeah, thanks. The, the core issue is that the subdivision and development servicing bylaw takes no, in, no consideration to preserving tree canopy during development. And that's something that we, uh, that I would like to fix with the team this term, that uh, we are looking at it, the tree for, uh, forest management canopy management strategy is going like this. So we're going to see a significant reduction in tree canopy before it goes back. I know it sounds great, but it's not good enough. And there is no tree canopy bylaw. There's a tree protection bylaw, which only applies in our urban areas, and we need to see that extended out into, the, uh, into some other areas to, and, it, and spread across the development process to see more significant trees retained, more higher quality trees planted in placement of these trees for more livable neighborhoods sooner than what we're going to see if we continue the way we are. And it's been completely at the behest of lobbying, which has prevented, and I think, an improvement to some of these issues. And that will continue without a team to, to stand up to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to our next question. And Eric Woodward, you are going to begin. This is a three-part question, mm -hmm. so I will, I will do it twice. I also want to remind everyone to keep that mic really close so that everybody can hear. Do you support removing the truck traffic route out of Fort Langley? How would you do that? In your mind, what is the most cost-effective way to do this? I'm going to read this out again. Do you support removing the truck traffic route out of Fort Langley? How would you do that? And in your mind, what is the most cost-effective way to do this? Yes. So in one minute, that's going to be very challenging. It's a very complex issue. Um, whether the Township Council wanted to do that or not, TransLink currently would not allow the removal of the truck route on 88th Avenue between 216th and Glover Road. The removal through the center of the village is approved, but requires some funding to upgrade an alternative route. Um, actually, there was a great solution prevented by to council by Councillor Richter to add that to the development cost charges bylaw to get that going now. Now it's doubled in price because there was no movement on it. So I think that there are ways to, to get these things done. We need to get more proactive in getting ahead of it. And uh, I would like to see the truck route on 88th uh, come off of there for the residents that live there. But TransLink currently sees that as required as an alternative east-west route to Highway 1. And it, with that not being permitted by TransLink, I think we need to get it done finally and follow the solution that was presented by Councillor Richter to fund it through development, get it done before it doubles again in price, which it has since then. Thanks. Yeah, I read all the studies and information on this, and I think the solution is pretty straightforward. The 88 to 216 route takes some work with, the, with Metro Vancouver, but let's talk about getting tra traffic off Glover Road and down a Crown River Road through this community. I came through here the other day, and a double, double uh, gravel truck pulled across down at the end where Windows was, and I thought, you know, there's so much traffic and people here, this is wrong. So I read it. The one solution is proposed is to actually put a bypass on Rollis and Crescent which would then allow all the traffic to go around and then still be able to take care of the industrial work down around River Road. It's about a $5 million cost. I think you could actually do it through uh, 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 <coughs> accessing the, the development cost charges. I did some research on that, and I think you could do that for this type of infrastructure. 
and it would be the quickest and most immediate solution. We would have to get to work with the ALR and the design of the road and then fund it and build it and get the trucks off Glover Road. Good, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have I've spoken to this uh, during my time on council as well. I agree. The uh, trucks have no business going through the town of uh, Fort Langley. Uh, anyone who spends a busy weekend here and stands at the corner, you can almost get hit sometimes because of that. So I have been in support of it. I am in support of that. I think it needs to be looked at to be funded through development as well as was mentioned. And I certainly would be speaking to that and ensuring that, uh, that my voice was strong in, in regards to that because I think it's a long time overdue and it's it's needing to be addressed thank you yeah I think we're uh, looks like all four in agreement here at, at the table um, the the Fort Langley truck route in order to in order to uh, complete the truck route and move it out of Fort Langley in 2020 was estimated 15.4 million dollars uh, about half of that was able to be covered through our DCC program so we still had a, a deficit of about seven million uh, that's not an insurmountable amount of money. It just takes the will of council to do that. We had a number of discussions, but uh, at the time, council didn't move it forward uh, during the budget time. It was a, a, a significant budget crunch as well during that time. We were right in the middle of a COVID period. I think as we move forward, um, this is certainly an item that I want to bring forward that I think we need to deal with. I don't think trucks should be coming down Glover Road, and I, and I agree with uh, many on here that we should get that done as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and um, Blair, you can keep the mic because you're going to respond uh, first to the next question. I'll read it out twice. Accessibility to and accountability of our local elected officials is crucial. What will you do to improve this accessibility to ensure important questions are answered and concerns are addressed? I will read it out one more time accessibility to and accountability of our local elected official officials is crucial. What will you do to improve this accessibility to ensure important questions are answered and concerns are addressed? Yeah, great uh, question. Um, you know, one of the things that I discovered when I got onto the council eight years ago was um, that we have a, a, a procedural bylaw of how we do meetings and in those meetings, um, public doesn't get a lot of opportunities to ask a lot of questions or to speak to council. They're, they're uh, minimized, uh, their time period is minimized to a five minute period and, uh, and, and then we move on and council itself doesn't get to speak very often to the same issue. So I'd like to see us have a, a type of meeting that we would have more regular which is a bit more like a town hall meeting where uh, council members and, and the mayor could sit there and, ta and take questions and there wasn't the same kind of restrictions that we would have in a normal, uh, normal type of meeting. So it's not a meeting to make decisions, but it's a meeting to hear from the public, to make sure the public has opportunity to come and speak, and I think we should have regular town hall meetings uh, rather than just simply relying on our procedural bylaw for the regular uh, council meetings. Yeah, thanks, I, I really appreciate this question. Uh, accountability, it's one of the reasons that uh, we're running a, a different approach to a platform and structuring it as a contract with residents and taxpayers to, to say what we're gonna do at campaign time and, and then actually do it, uh, not what we've seen with 208 Street. And we would also wanna end the closed door decision-making process that we've seen here in Fort Langley with the closure of the outdoor pool and a special closed meeting with not one ounce of public input or concern for public input. We would want to end the special land deals that we've seen, which again, we can't talk about or disclose to the public, and I don't think that's right. We've got one that was done here recently next to the museum, and another one pending here for the waterfront in Fort Langley. That's what we need to do, is have accountability and accessibility by changing some of the culture around these closed door decision-making processes, and listen and, uh, listen and serve the public. And third, accountability starts with disclosing your assets as required by provincial legislation. Thank you. Thank you. I believe in direct access and open access and open forums. I also believe, though, you should have access directly to the person that you elected. My office would be open. The door would be open. The meeting room there would be available to people. There would be time to come and just meet with the mayor one-on-one -on -one or with a group anytime. And I would be there to meet with you. I have, for 24 and a half years, returned phone calls, personally. And the same thing with emails. And I believe it's important that part of that access is actual personal relationship with people who get to come and see you eye to eye and get to talk to you about their issues and concerns 
and how you can put the things together with your staff and with open forums to actually bring for forward solutions for people in a way that they are comfortable not always wanting to be in a large group of people, but sometimes it's a very personal decision that they want to make or advice, and they should be able to get that too. Thank you. Uh, so citizen engagement is something that is very important to me. It's something I first ran on 11 years ago. Uh, it was a part of my platform. Uh, it was again in 2014, 2018, and it is again today. Uh, I, I think we really need to look at how we engage with our residents, and I think we need to be embracing um, online, online technology for that. Uh, we have seen uh, a change in the last four years in accessing our council meetings and documents that has actually seen us go backwards. Uh, we, one of the things I worked on while I was on council was to see us see a, a better program using uh, technology to actually engage. We had the ability to turn, with a flick of a switch, to turn on an option that allowed residents to actually engage during our meetings, to able, uh, actually send questions to council, to actually be able to engage and actually have a conversation in regards to the, the meeting agenda. There was a lot of things that we could have done better and I hope that we can actually look at doing this now and properly engage with our residents and use technology to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And Michelle, you can hang on to the mic. You are up next or first for the next question and I will read it out twice. What would your approach be to improving housing affordability? What would your approach be to improving housing affordability? Thank you. Uh, so this is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, so yes, we, I mean, it, it's something that we need to be addressing in our community and across all, all of uh, BC and Canada as well. And one of the things we need to look at, first of all, is speeding up the process, allowing our development to get through the process quicker. Well, that's less cost to the developer uh, as well. Uh, and we need to be also looking to be uh, using inclusionary zoning to actually be requiring affordable housing and rental uh, housing to be actually required of developers. We need to be ho holding their feet to the fire and actually requiring a percentage of their, uh, their developments to be affordable, to be non-market housing. It's crucial. And I think we need to be, until we look at the whole picture, until we approach things from a perspective of looking at non-market as much as we are looking at market, I don't think we're going to see the needle move. So thank you. I think we have uh, two categories when it comes to housing affordability. It's to, first of all, make houses themselves more affordable. The first thing we do with that is we don't add extra costs to builders. We already are the fifth most expensive community in the Lower Mainland to build a home. There's lots of data on that. If you look at all the different fees that are added, we're already the fifth most expensive. We do not want to add more expenses to the cost of housing and building and providing homes for our community. But secondly, we have those who have a lot of difficulty even renting a home or finding rent that they can afford. So we need to find ways that, at, at through our either tax incentives or through the use of our CACs to find ways that we can work with the builders of our homes to provide affordable homes, sections of condos, sections of townhouses, even some single family homes that would be below market. There's a lot of strategies that local government can use, but first of all, we must not increase the cost of building houses in the first place. Thanks. So this is uh, an, an, uh, a con an issue really near and dear to us as a team, and it's going to take a team to change it. Um, you know, no matter how many times uh, Blair Whitmarsh tells you that it'll raise the cost of housing to get a fair deal from development, it just doesn't make it true. The real challenge that affordable housing isn't happening is because of the incentive model isn't working. It is based on a definition of rents in Vancouver. So someone can get a label for an affordable house here, and it's got not affordable at all. It's two, two to $3,000 a month, which is defined as affordable in West Van. It's not affordable here, but you get a mountain of incentives. We need a team to change that structure and get actual affordable housing. Inclusionary zoning for rentals and affordable with a real definition is a direction that we want to take it. We have a team that's going to do it. And this is one of the reasons we need to be upfront with a contract with any residents and taxpayers, because these things will not change without people that are committed to do it and know how to do it, and then we'll actually do it. Thank you. Thank you. I think you need to take innovation back into the marketplace and understand how affordability happens. You need to take some of the costs out, but at the same time bring innovation back in. For instance, I'll just give you one example, and this is the type of thing I would believe we could do. If you're building a two-bedroom condo, add on a 
a bachelor suite beside it with a lock-off. Allow people to have a rental there that will actually have, uh, help them pay a mortgage so they can buy the suite because they can get rent off it. Because if a senior family member, the flexibility is to allow them to move into there while they move out of their home and transition. Or you can actually have it if your family expands and not have to move. That's the flexibility. Now take the affordable mix into it, like affordable home ownership, which you can do with innovation. I know how to do this. And you can do it by leases and contracts and how you put equity back in and help people get their first home and then build on it together. And it's a solution that I have worked out that our, our team will bring forward and we will accomplish on behalf of this community. And if we can pass the mic down to Eric, please. The next question is, what do you feel is the best approach to homelessness? How involved should the Township of Langley be, or what supports, if any, should we provide? I'll read it a second time. What do you feel is the best approach to homelessness? How involved should the Township of Langley be, or what supports, if any, should we provide? So th this is a very challenging issue for local government without the resources to bring to bear on the problem. But at the local level, there's things we can do. First one is get in place a continuum of different housing within the community so that we're not relying on a broken model, in my opinion, of buying up motels and putting people inside these motels without supports and a transition out to that into a more livable situation. So we're going to be putting in place 300 units of specialized housing within this term by potentially combining them on land already owned by the taxpayer or with fire halls. We need to build two new fire halls. It's a model that's worked very well in Vancouver. It's a model that we're going to be looking at. This is why it's been so great to have people like Bob, Barb Martins on this team who's been dealing with this problem in Vancouver for 20 years, knows it inside and out. I encourage every one of you to talk to her. And this is the team that we have that others can't bring to bear on tr problems like this and really get a collaborative approach with people in the community that are there to support and do everything they can the local government can do, knowing what works and what doesn't work, and she does. It is a complex problem. And I dealt with it on many levels. The reality is, is the people in our streets that are homeless have a number of other as have a number of aspects that affect them. One is usually mental health, and then it's combined with addictions. To actually figure out the mental health, you actually, actually get past the addictions. Nutrition is important, so you cannot decide to just build housing and put people in it without the supports, both nutritional and mental health supports, in order to do that. I believe this province needs to do more more therapeutic communities like Baldy Hughes and places like like Wagner Hill Farms in our community. Wagner Hill Farms has actually had 8,000 men go through that facility with about a 75 to 80% success rate over the last 30 years. We need to have a place where people can go to get well and spend some time. It's just not a one-piece solution and it's certainly not one you could comple complexly answer and give all the solutions to in 60 seconds, but we will work with all levels of government to find the solutions to, social, to homelessness, mental health and addictions and integration back into our communities. Thank you very much. Um, so this is definitely a, an issue that until all levels of government step up, up and actually uh, admit that they need to play a role in solving it, we're not going to get there. I think we need to look at wraparound supports. We need to view this as a holistic approach. We need to realize that it's not just about providing a home for someone, that there are other needs, there are greater needs uh, in order to see the, that individual be successful. And I think it's about addressing uh, what those needs are and ensuring that all level, levels of government are working together to ensure that those those individuals are supported and I think until we stop pointing fingers of what level of government should be doing what uh, I think we're not going to see a solution so that is the this is an issue that is certainly uh, affects all levels of government it certainly affects uh, all kinds of aspects of our society it's a multifaceted challenge but it's also a regional issue. It's not just in the Township of Langley. We need collaborative leadership that can work with those, particularly on the south of the Fraser, to come up with a south of the Fraser solution first. We need to deal with the root of the problem. It's not just putting up 300 homes and saying, there you go. It's about dealing with the uh, mental health issues. 
It's about dealing with substance abuse issues, and it's about dealing with financial pressures. That's the root of the problem, and that's where the work needs to be done, and it takes collaborative leadership. It takes working with other mayors, other councillors across the region to come up with a regional approach. You simply can't come up with a Band-Aid solution and build a few homes and say, there you go, we're done. Okay, and if you can hand the mic to back to Rich, who's going to start us off on the next question. As the population grows, what do you propose to provide and pay for when it comes to public physical recreation facilities to meet the needs of all residents? I'll read it one more time. As the population grows, what do you propose to provide and pay for when it comes to public physical recreation facilities to meet the needs of all residents? I believe the first thing we should do is use the assets that we have. And in the case of, for instance, fields, all weather fields, you could put artificial fields inside any track we have in the community and put, an art put a track, a walking track, at every single high school in this community. And that would give people access to something close to home. I think we can't forget that it's not just about certain sports. You know, there's pickleball for people that are seniors and there's other activities that we need to do Recreation and music are also important in the arts. And so what we will have a plan to, to integrate and move throughout this community the needs that are going to be in the work creation with the facilities that exist so that we can maximize our use and add as we go the ones that we need. And we'll do it in a way that's important to the community and listening to each community because they can tell you the needs and wants of one community in, in this area and another because we're a community of communities is different and we need to work with individual each individual area of Langley on all of this to bring it together and we I think we, we have a comprehensive plan to do that and do it within the budget. Thank you. So in 2016 I put forward a motion uh, to create a community amenity contributions policy uh, for the township and these types of uh, infrastructure and the social infrastructure and the needs of our community that weren't being paid for by growth is what brought that uh, forward for me. Uh, so as that has now been presented to this current council, uh, the needs that are still needing to be addressed are not addressed in that policy. Uh, funding for fire halls, funding for pools, these types of things that really are required for a growing community need to be collected through CACs and paid for by the growth that we're experiencing in our community. And I hope to be able to be a part of that conversation and to see this policy be addressed so that we can actually start collecting the money that has been left on the table for a very, very long time. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly supportive of uh, looking at the CAC program and looking at ways we can expand it. One of the unique things about the Township of Langley is that we have six distinct communities. And in those communities, we should have recreation facilities that meet the needs of those communities. And for each community, those needs will be slightly different. Uh, we, don't, we know that we need expanded soccer fields. We know we need some new ice arenas. And we need some of those locations in, in within those communities. Um, we know that we need swimming pools, and I'm supportive, uh, much to other people suggesting, but I am supportive of building an outdoor swimming pool here in Fort Langley, a 25-meter outdoor pool. And I think we should continue to work towards those kinds of things. We can do it within the budget, but we must continue to uh, meet the needs of our growing community while managing our budget at the same time. But I think we can meet a lot of those recreation needs. In addition to that, I'm a big supporter of the fine arts facility that we need to have in our community. We don't have a fine arts, a real fine arts facility um, in our community, and that is a form of recreation that many people participate in that's not traditional sport. And so I think we need to encourage us to move down that path. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate this question. We've obviously, uh, the Contract with Langley team has been campaigning very hard on a, on a very significant catch-up with all of the population growth that we've been experiencing from a youth soccer campus to a community center for Willoughby to a Alder Grove Community Center expansion. Uh, in addition to an expansion for Noel Booth and an upgrade for DW Poppy, we've fallen way, way behind on recreation and all you have to do is talk to a user group and you'll find that out. And uh, The iterative approach, I think, reveals that how to touch the status quo is in terms of how bad the situation is for many user groups and youth in our community. And it's not a budget trial, it's that is just an excuse to try to win an election campaign. The, the thing is we can pay for it through a fair deal from development the way other communities are already doing by charging the same rates that Surrey is charging, which doesn't raise the cost of housing and investing and planning for the future now where you can wait 10 years and it'll cost double or it won't happen at all. While kids right now 
can't play soccer, we haven't built an ice sheet for years, we do not have a plan and we're going to get one done. Thank you. Okay, and we can hand the mic to Michelle. So the question is, how do you see the role that community associations play in the decision-making process that the township utilizes? How would you support community associations throughout the township? I'll read it one more time. How do you see the role that community associations play in the decision-making process the township uh, utilizes? How would you support community associations throughout the township? Absolutely, thank you. Um, and I agree that the community associations play a vital role in our community. They provide an opportunity for the voices of the, the local community to be heard. They're uh, an opportunity for community members to learn about things, as was you know, mentioned over there in the corner of the, the water issues. Um, and I, I think we really need to support those associations as uh, local governments, and we need to engage with them further. I think it's uh, an opportunity that we have there that I'd certainly like to see us do. I think that, uh, again, as was mentioned earlier, relationship building is really important, and the ability to build those relationships and to have conversations and to be open to hearing you know, differing opinions than your own. I think it's really important skill to have uh, sitting in these seats, and I think that we need to be encouraging, um, you know, more of those conversations, even if they're difficult sometimes. Thank you. Well, community association is something that I've been supportive of uh, the entire time I've been on council. Uh, in fact, uh, during our council term, we agreed to provide some monetary, uh, uh, some money to the community association so they could actually afford to operate small operation dollars, but I think we need to expand it. I think we need to make community associations really an integral part of how we do business in the township. Uh, community associations are really the heart of their individual community. We have six distinct communities, and we don't have that many community associations. In fact, during the last couple of years, a couple of them have folded. Uh, in Brookswood, Fernridge, my own area, that, that community association has just folded and it's gone. And I think that's a real shame because a lot of this, the understanding of the community comes from those community associations. So I'd like to see us provide some financial assistance. I'd like to see us provide some staff assistance to really help to make those community associations flourish and to be able to give the input that we need into our community because we want a lot of input when we're going to have a council full of independence. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that we're all going to agree here that community associations have a very valuable vital role to play in civic society. You know, they can engage with the local community on the ground, I think, with the size of our community and being a community of communities in a way that the township can't. And uh, I value it. I value the input that I've received from the Alder Grove Community Association to talk about what they would like to see for the Alder Grove Community Center expansion. I've, you know, learned a lot from the surveys conducted by the Fort Langley Community Association on some of the ideas that maybe I hadn't thought of. And so I found it personally just on a, on a councillor level to be very valuable and I think they should be and continue to be supported by the Township of Langley and the valuable work to, to bring their viewpoints forward um, along with other members in the community that, that communicate with us directly. I think all of the community input is important and when it's organized in that fashion I think it's, uh, it's extra important and we, we all pay attention to it. Thank you. They're as grassroots as it gets. They're in touch with the community. They're on the ground. They needed to be supportive. We should recognize that this community was built by volunteers. People who get bay back starting 50, 100 years ago started to do things like build community centers with their volunteer time and labor. Community associations are as important a piece of the governance of any jurisdiction as anybody because they are on the ground. They do talk to people every day. They live in the community and they can give back the real feedback of what the things that are concerning people in the community. I think they should be supported. I think they should be applauded. And we should always recognize the time they give back to our community because they do it as volunteers giving back to every one of us. Thank you. And if you can pass the mic to Blair, please. The next question is, how would you encourage the growth of the arts in Langley? How would you propose to support theater, musical performances, festivals, visual arts, and dance. And I will say it one more time. How would you encourage the growth of the arts in Langley? How would you propose to support theater, musical performances, festivals, visual arts, and dance? 
Yeah, well, certainly, uh, as I mentioned, I think that the, the Fine Arts Centre, having some kind of Fine Arts Centre, and we've talked about it being up uh, in the area of the Langley Event Centre, is a really key part of developing the fine arts community. Having a place that they can call home, a central location where they can display and show their art, where we can see performances of various kinds is really critical. But I'm also pleased about some of the things like the new museum that's coming here in Fort Langley. I had a chance to walk through it, uh, just some of the, the outside, inside the building, of course much of it's not done, but just to get a sense of what that's gonna be like, and there's a small theater area and places to display art, um, it's going to be a tremendous bonus to the Fort Langley community and the entire township. So to me, those kind of facilities really start the ball rolling in terms of getting the fine arts community going. And once you have that, people feel confident in being able to hold events, hold festivals, and knowing they have a place to call home. And so we need to build a home for the fine arts community. Thank you. Yeah, I think everyone on this panel here is going to agree with this. Uh, on council this term, it has been a priority. Uh, it's been announced by the federal government to contribute uh, approximately $21, $22 million to the Project Langley Event Centre in the last federal election. And I, I support, and I know the team supports, uh, getting that project done uh, with the contribution required uh, from the municipality. I toured the, the arts facility out in Chilliwack about two to three years ago uh, to learn a lot more about that with two theaters, not one, but different sizes, different uses, staging areas, foyers, different events can be held and all kinds of multi-purpose rooms there. And, and that's the kind of facility that, that I think I've heard from members of the arts community, you know, that it's not just about one size theater, 1,600 square feet, 1,600 seats, but it's different sizes and different uses and multi-purpose rooms and having, finally having this issue done so that a graduation from Mountain or Walnut Grove can finally be held within the Township of Langley. These are the kind of things, uh, you know, at a public facility, these are the kind of things that, you know, that we can all do and I'm very confident that uh, whoever is elected actually, this, this project will move forward. Thank you. We have a very exciting comprehensive plan how we can accomplish a fine arts facility, music theater, all of those things together in an integrated fashion at a center of our community. But in addition to that, we also believe we have to expand our relationship while we're doing that with our school district so that we can actually rent space when it's not being used so people could actually do dance, teach dance and other activities in the facilities we already have in our schools. So we think it's important that we contribute to that while we're trying to move forward the plan. And when you see the plan, you'll understand how it can be built. It will integrate with other recreation and how we'll pay for it, how we use our land to make it accomplish. It's very comprehensive. Uh, we've been working on it for a while. I have a pretty good idea how it will accomplish. And we will give you more information as we go through. But I can tell you it's a priority for us that we get to a fine arts facility in this community. We know how to get it done. Thank you very much. I spoke very passionately uh, to supporting this during my time on council. I am a proud dance mom to four daughters, uh, one of them who dance competitively. And, and this is certainly needed in our community. Uh, you know, the dance um, and arts isn't necessarily maybe as well organized and able to lobby like some of the, uh, the sports, uh, sports groups that we see. I think they're really needing a strong voice in, and ensuring that our arts are supported in our community. It's essential. Yeah, and so I think I'm very happy to hear all of us unanimous on this because I do agree with, with Eric. I think we'll see this uh, come together finally this term. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we're moving on to the last question. And if we can hand the mic to Rich, please. And the question is, commercial parking in Fort Langley is a concern for residents and businesses. With large areas still to be developed in the village center, what kind of parking strategies do you envision? I'll read it one more time. Commercial parking in Fort Langley is a concern for residents and businesses. With large areas still to be developed in the village center, what kind of parking strategies do you envision? I think if you're going to develop in this, in the village, the parking has to be built into the building. It doesn't have to be zero lot line to zero lot line to zero to lot line to zero lot line. You can build parking for people that are going to want to go and use the stores within the building. You can structure it with the parking that the residents above, there's residents above together. It shouldn't be on the rest of the village to take the burden of that parking if somebody wants to develop a piece of property. So it should be integrated into the building and it can be done. We know how it can be done, we've all seen it. And in the future, that's how we should be approaching the development of the lands in Fort Langley to make sure 
there's service for the public, there's parking for the public, but also public for the residents. But don't put the burden on the streets or the other residents in the community. Thank you. I, I think this is um, m multiple sort of question here. I, I think we need to be ensuring, first of all, that we do have the, have the parking. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the idea of featuring a large parking lot somewhere, uh, you know, close by to accommodate that. I, I think that doesn't really keep with uh, with the feel of, of our Fort, the Fort Langley community to have, you know, a large parking lot. Um, I think we need to be looking at creative ways to ensure the parking is utilized uh, and, and share the parking that we have. Uh, and also, you know, we are, this is a very walkable part of our community. Uh, and so we, we should be supporting that as well. But I don't think it's, um, you know, the solution is necessarily a, a parkade or a parking lot somewhere to, to accommodate that. I think that doesn't really keep with the feel of the community. Thank you. Parking is a, is a challenge in Fort Langley, and certainly it is a walkable community, and we all love that part of, of Fort Langley. But we know that a lot of tourists come to Fort Langley, and many of our businesses here rely on, the, on, on tourists to come and, and, and take part in, their, in the Fort Langley community. I think that we need to look at, at uh, certainly developing parking within structures as we build them. And I know there's lots of discussion about what's happening at the waterfront. I think that whatever happens there, that there should be parking within that structure. Uh, to allow parking for the community, that it's not just only parking for the use of, for the people that are in that building, but parking for the public to come and enjoy Fort Langley and participate in that. We certainly want to keep it to be a walkable community, but we also want to make sure that we establish parking as we go. And, and looking at the parking regulations uh, in Fort Langley, and I'm certainly not uh, supportive as we move forward of having any kind of paid parking. I think parking should be free to the citizens of this community. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a question that's been going on here for 15, 20 years. When I was the president of the Fort Langley BIA for five years, uh, it was a constant challenge. And what we discovered was that we have a number of staff members on a number of the smaller buildings have nowhere to park. And so they ended up consuming all of the on-street parking for eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. If you solve that problem, we'll have parking available for the public. So I think that we're going to disagree here a little bit. I think long term, um, as development proceeds, that there's a plan for shared parking similar to what's occurring in the downtown of, of Alder Grove, where that was built into their core plan 10 years ago, and they're starting to see progress with that. There has to be a plan for parking. Um, where you would deal with the staff, you have on-street enforcement of the two to three hours, which isn't enforced because of the staff. And I think you start to get turnover where people could visit the village for two or three hours, but people that work here would have a reliable place to park. So it's a long-term solution. There's a number of ideas that need to be explored to get it done, and it's a complicated issue. And I think there's a number of different ways that it can be approached realistically and, and financially responsibly. Thank you. Okay, actually you can pass the mic back to Eric. So we are now moving on to the closing portion of the program. Uh, each of the candidates have one minute to say whatever they need to say before we close. Um, and then I will give a few um, thank yous and also explain about a little bit of a time for meet and greet if you wanted to ask any other questions that, you did, that, you, uh, that were burning for you. So we're going to begin with Eric. Thank you. So again, I would encourage everyone to please look at our website, contractwithlangley.org. I won't be able to get through all of the things I'd want to leave you with here in one minute. We have a great team. We have a great plan. We're being very upfront with what it is and how we're going to pay for it and why it's required. And we've assembled an amazing team that can get it done. Fire, policing, construction, farming, small business, public service. You know, over, like I said at the beginning, over 150 years of public service experience. It's a unique, amazing opportunity for Langley to consider a transparent, honest, sincere group that has a plan, has come together to execute the plan, and to get a real plan for our growth and catch up with our chronic infrastructure deficit in parks and roads and in facilities and get a fair deal from development to pay for it. And if we don't get this done now, it's going to go on and on and on under the status quo options that are available. And I want to fix it. Our team wants to deal with it. We want to make Langley better. We want to solve these problems so we're not talking about them again four years again from now. Thank you. It's up to Rich, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, I think tonight, if you look at the four candidates from here, we all have a passion for this community. We all want to do things for this community. 
So I think the choice is you can you elect a leader that knows how to make the deals come together, that can bring all levels to governments together, including our Indigenous people, that has experience doing that, or, or other choices. I, I respect for every single person at this table and what they've got they bring to the table. I bring to the table what I just described. I can put people together. I know how to leverage dollars to make them work for this community. I've done it in the past. I also know how to work with people and break down barriers even when it's difficult to get things done because I know how to work with people, respect them, trust them, challenge them with their integrity and yours, and, and at the end of the day, you'll come to a solution that you can find solutions to the most difficult issues and find solutions for the community if you can work together, and I can do that. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to use this time to, to thank all of you for being here tonight. It's a long evening, um, and I look out in the audience, and there is just there's so many engaged citizens that are here learning about all of us running, about the trustees who are running also. Uh, there is 31 of us running in this election for uh, mayor and council, and that's a lot, and it's a lot of people to get to know, and it's a lot of information to, to absorb, and I just... You know, every election that I have ran in, I have been just struck at the community that we live in and how much I love it, but how much, how many people are just engaged enough to take the time to actually learn about the people who are wanting to serve this community. And I'm, I'm just thankful that you're all here. And I hope you uh, go to the polls on the 15th and you bring a friend and you bring your kids and you show your kids what it is to be an engaged citizen and what it is to vote in, in our community. Thank you. Well, this election is about you, and it's about you deciding what you want. What kind of leadership do you want on council? What kind of mayor do you want to have at the council table? This election is about you deciding if you want to have a, a team that's pre-selected for you, that can decide for you what's going to happen for the next four years. And once selected, they don't have to listen to you because they've got the votes. This is about you deciding, do you want independent leaders, people that look at an issue independently, look at each issue on its own, and decide what is the best for this community. And sometimes councillors will agree with each other, and other times they won't. Sometimes the mayor will be on his own and, or her, her own, and sometimes they won't. So what we need to have is a leader that is about collaboration. Re considering the diverse community we have, respecting the people in our community, and allowing those people to have a voice, not just at election time, but a voice every single day for the next four years. Vote Blair for mayor, independent. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Um, once again, I want to just take a, a moment to thank all of the volunteers that helped to make this important uh, event happen, certainly the Fort Langley Community Association, who's organized the event this evening. Thanks to Wendell's for keeping us going with the coffee. Um, thank you to the candidates for taking um, this very, very important event very seriously and certainly sharing um, as much as you could in the time limit that you had. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to attend also tomorrow, tomorrow evening where we will hear from all of the candidates for town councillor. I believe there are 28 of them, so um, don't worry, I'm going to keep the times going. Um, I would uh, like to now, though, invite you to, and I'm hoping that the mayor candidates can stay around for a little bit, so that if, there, if you have any burning questions for them, that you have an opportunity to have a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time um, with them before you leave this evening. Thank you being, for being such an engaged audience um, and a very respectful audience, and I hope to see you all tomorrow evening. Thank you. Thank you.